we're still working on statistical inference of the difference between two proportions. So here's another example. A 2015 Nielsen poll found that 48% of households had at least one subscription video on demand, such as Netflix, uh, while a 2016 poll found that 50% had at least one subscription video on demand. Suppose that both polls consisted of 1,400 randomly selected participants. Media analysts claim that there was an increase in the proportion of people with at least one subscription video on demand. Uh, so it says since there was an increase in the proportion. So that tells us what sort of hypothesis test we're about to do. Uh, so our sample P1 is 0.48. Our sample P2 is 0.5. Our sample sizes are both 1400. And one thing we're going to need is we're going to need the number of successes. Now we weren't told the number of successes, um, but we can figure that out using the proportions and the sample sizes. So if we know that uh, pi hat is xi divided by uh, the sample size, then what that means is that pi hat times the sample size is equal to uh, xi. So I'll just multiply these two numbers together. 48% of 1,400 is 672, and half of 1,400 is, of course, 700. Um, then we need to state our hypotheses. The null hypothesis is always that the two proportions are the same. In other words, there was no increase. And the alternative hypothesis is that there was an increase. So we have to be a little careful with how we write this hypothesis down. If there was an increase, then that means that P2 is going to be greater than P1. In other words, P1 minus P2 is going to be negative. Since you're subtracting a greater number, the difference should be negative. All right, now we calculate our test statistic. We're going to need the standard error, which means we're going to need the uh, pooled proportion parameter. So that's going to be P hat is equal to 672 plus 700 over 1400 plus 1400. And that is 0.49. If you think about it, if one of your proportions is 0.48 and the other is 0.5 and they both have the same sample sizes, then p hat should be their actual average. Then we're going to take the standard error which is the square root of p hat times uh, 1 minus p hat. So that's going to be 0.49 times 0.51 uh, times the sum of 1 over both sample sizes. All under a square root. And that is 0 0.0189. And then our test statistic is p1 hat minus p2 hat minus 0 over the standard error, which is negative 1.0582. Uh, now let's say that you originally chose p1 to be the 2016 amount and p2 to be the 2015 amount. Uh, then you would be subtracting backwards, and your alternative hypothesis would be that P1 minus P2 is greater than zero. Um, that's totally fine as long as you're consistent, you'll get the same results either way. All right, next we're going to find the p-value. So our hypothesis, our alternative hypothesis, is that the true proportion is, uh, that the difference in the proportions is less than zero. So what that means is that I'm going to find my z-score, which is negative one, and I'm going to find the probability that I observe my data or something more extreme, which would be this area that I'm shading right here. So I'm going to use the normal CDF of negative 9999 up to my z-score. If my z-score is negative, I leave it that way. The only time I take the absolute value of the z-score is when I'm doing the two-tailed hypothesis test. Uh, this number turns out to be 0.145. And so the interpretation of my p-value 
is that if there were no increase, in the proportion of households with a subscription video on demand, we'd see our data, or more extreme, 14.5% of the time. Therefore, our conclusion is that there is little to no evidence that the proportion has increased. Remember, when we interpret our p-value we always do that in terms of the null hypothesis. And when we state our conclusion, we always do so in terms of our alternative hypothesis. Now we want to talk about the types of errors that can arise in hypothesis testing. Since hypothesis testing is all based on probability, it's possible we can get a faulty sample that gives us the wrong idea, and that's why it's so important to replicate experiments. So we have reality, and then we have our test. In reality, the null hypothesis is either true or false. Our test will either tell us that the alternative hypothesis is unlikely or that it's likely. If the null hypothesis is true and our alternative hypothesis looks unlikely based on our test, then that's great. That's what we would like to have. Those two things correlate together. But if the null hypothesis is true and our test has told us that the alternative hypothesis is likely, we have committed what is called a type 1 error. Uh, conversely, if the null hypothesis is false and our test tells us that the alternative hypothesis is unlikely, that is a type 2 error. But if the null hypothesis is false and the alternative hypothesis is likely, then again, our test got it right. Um, personally, I can't remember whether something is type 1 or type 2. Um, However, typically you say true, false, right? You say the words in that order. Uh, so type 1 is where the null is true, and type 2 is where the null is false. So that's kind of an easy way to keep it straight in your head. All right, here are a few examples of the concepts involved in hypothesis testing. If the null is true in reality, then we would expect the test statistic to be small because it's going to be something with a high p-value. Remember, small test statistics are likely. Most test statistics are between negative 1 and 1. In other words, those are the ones that are the most likely to appear if the null hypothesis is true. If the null is false, in that case, we would expect the test statistic to be large. We would expect the test statistic to be surprising, which is something with a large z-score. The greater the magnitude, or the absolute value of the test statistic, the smaller the p-value in a two-sided test. That's what that's referring to. And then here's one last example. Let's uh, test the hypothesis of the proportion equaling 20% versus the alternative hypothesis of the true proportion being greater than 20%, uh, where the context here is the proportion of orange M&Ms in uh, a bag of candy. Uh, based on the data collected, suppose we obtain a p-value of 0.201. All right, well, if the population proportion is truly 0.24, what type of error was committed if any. All right, well, if the population proportion is truly 0.24, that means that the null hypothesis is false. But if the p-value is 0.201, we're going to say that there's little to no evidence for the alternative. All right, 
since the null is false, but we're still saying that the alternative is unlikely, that's considered a type 2 error. If the null is false, we would hope that our test statistic would be large.